Good morning. I'll try that again. Good morning. Okay, good. Just want to make sure you're all with us. Um, so great to be with you. As Martin said, um, this church means a whole lot to me and my family. And just seeing so many of you now who have been such a part of that, who have been so good um, to me and Emily and Wells and Charlotte, thank you. Um, I mean it. I, we praise God for you. And I know I'm not the only one. So grateful to get to be with you. If you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to turn toward uh, Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament. And um, I know kids who are in the house, Dean, encourage you to read along as well. So if you need to look at the table of contents, that's okay. No shame here. Um, But it should be in the Old Testament. And Ecclesiastes chapter 3, beginning in verse 9. Ecclesiastes 3, beginning in verse 9. To Solomon, who's writing near the end of his life. And he says, what gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his or her toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. The grass withers. The flower fades. The word of our God will stand forever. Thanks be to him. Let's pray. So, Father, as we come to this word, we pray that your spirit would be present to do the work of leading us. And we trust that you have, that you are at work to lead us, yes, on Sundays, but also all throughout the week. Until the day when you will lead all of your people all the way home. So until that day, keep us hopeful. Would you keep us repentant? and eager to turn toward Jesus, our life. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, as Martin said, I get the privilege of getting to pastor um, a church that is uh, about five years in, and it is uh, made up roughly of 20 and 30-year-old young professionals. As we set out, that was not who we were sort of after. That was not the target demographic, as they ask you about. Um, It's just so happened that that's where we are. And one of the unique things about that demographic is that they care deeply about their work. You care deeply about your work. I learned that as a child growing up in this congregation. And a lot of you are really good at what you do, and you work really hard. So it's not just a Dallas thing. It's actually not just a Starkville, Mississippi thing. This This is a reality that touches down at the heart level all over the world. Gallup Incorporated, who I believe now is actually based in Washington, D.C., one of the original sort of research um, uh, agencies, actually just did one of their largest uh, pollings all throughout the world. It was called What the Whole Wide World is Thinking. And they unearthed what was uh, said to be Gallup's largest finding in its entire, I believe, 85-year history. And so they did a poll across um, countries and nation states and Uh, rich and poor, old and young, wealthy, all the above. And one of the things that they found out is that what people long for, and again, this is in recent years, one of the things that people long for more than anything else, think about food and shelter, you think about love, people long for a good job. That's what they want. That's what Gallup found out. Well, okay, well, what is a good job? Like, what, what are they talking about here? Because we could be all over the place in our definitions and experiences of that. A good job, according to Gallup, is one at minimum with 30 hours of work a week and a consistent paycheck from an employer. But it's also, they've come to find out, and you think, well, why is there such a low, um, like, why are there so many jobs that are still out there? That doesn't seem to match up with what we're seeing here, right? But a good job is also considered this, especially in a digital age, as the world is getting smaller, people long for work where you enjoy your day-to-day job, you receive stable and predictable pay, and you have a sense of purpose. 
And what Gallup has found out in this really metrics-driven, research-based industry is that roughly only 40% of Americans are experiencing what you might call a good job. So again, it's, it's not just those of you who are working these nine to five, you're putting sort of your, your hand to the plow. It's, it's those who are in here and you're in school and you're, you're longing to be something. Uh, my little boy right now is a four-year-old, wants to be a pirate fireman. So we're working on sword fights and getting some time on the hose in the backyard, right? <laughs> but if you're in middle school, if you're in high school and you're in algebra two, just trying to stay afloat, um, if you're into your retirement years, and you kind of wrestle with that and you, you have some angst where you look back on maybe a job and some things that you did that were great, but there was a lot that you didn't get to do. This text is for you. This text is for you. And here's why. Because you are created, as what scripture calls, an image bearer of the one true God. And what you find when you come to the scriptures is that not only do people care deeply about their work, but God, the maker of heaven and earth, as we say in the ancient creed, that he cares deeply about your work. And as an image bearer, that is what you and I are called to do in one way or another. And so for all the fears and the frustrations with our work, the thorns and the thistles of the ground, this Genesis 3.17, Ecclesiastes calls work God's gift to you and me. Can you believe that? Like this is a gift to humanity. So seeing it as a gift, and that's what I want us to do here in these next few moments together, seeing work as a gift should enable us, one, not to be crushed by work, but also not to undervalue it, but to receive it for what it actually is, that is a gift, in order that we might redeem it. And long before redemption was kind of a religious word, it was actually a marketplace term, that is to buy back in the service of. And that's what Jesus is doing all throughout Scripture, and that's what Solomon is envisioning here. So let's look at this together. We're going to look at work through the lens of the gospel and consider three movements. Number one, God's good design for work, and these should be in your, your bulletin, your worship guide. Number two, our deep frustration with work. And then finally, we're going to look at the promised redemption of work. So wherever you are, wherever you're at, know that this is for you. Number one, let's look at God's good design for work. Work was designed by God at the outset of creation. It was commissioned in the garden of God. You see this in places like Genesis chapter 1 where God creates all things. He is the first and foremost worker. It was meant to be actually God's extension, his own work within the world as he calls Adam and Eve, these image bearers to reflect the character of God, that is to, to possess these capacities and qualities of love and rationality and justice, but also begin to cultivate the earth and to work it and to keep it. See this in Genesis chapter two, it's, it's what biblical scholars call the cultural mandate. So you hear it here, Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man and the woman and put them in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it, to keep it and to work it. And notice here that at the outset of Eden, the work that God calls humanity, even us to in our day, is the work of one, cultivation, and the work of what you might call preservation. Now, they're distinct from one another, but they're also highly dependent upon each other. Both have an errant God-given value, and both are necessary for the flourishing of creation. So let's think about the work of cultivation. What does that mean? That means that you are taking the raw materials of this world, whether you're in finance, whether you're in engineering. I think about my own dad. You take music, for example. You're taking notes, maybe bad ones at first, and you're trying to put them together with a beat. And then all of a sudden, you have a really good Friday night, right? Which is God's gift to you. But then you also have the work of preservation. So you think that about those who are in the medical profession. You think about doctors. You think about the work of lawyers. You think about... Think about in all these works, it's not just cultivation and pr preservation. I mean, think about, think about maybe the industry that you're in, but together we are called together. All of these industries bound up, given by God to do the work of participation with God. And this is how God brings about all of his goodness into the world. One of the great recoveries of the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century was a biblical vision for all of God's image bearers from the Pope to the milkmaid, this was a big recovery of what was called the priesthood of all believers, as well as maybe you've heard this, the Protestant work ethic. 
to see their work as dignified and immensely valuable to God's providence, which is his work in the world. So think about this. So again, I told you I have a little boy, four years old. So we're sitting at the breakfast table, and one of the things that I'll ask him from time to time is like, where does, where does that come from? He loves cereal. He loves Cheerios and this little Texas Rangers helmet. And he's sitting there eating it, and he's confused, and I'm saying, where did that come from? And, and he says, well, you poured it. I said, no, 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 but God gave it to you. And just like any of us would be, he goes, yeah, but you poured it. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 but where did, it, like, where did it come from? How did God get it here? Because it didn't just fall out of the sky. No, there was a cow, and there had to be a dairy farmer who got the milk from the cow. And there had to be somebody that drove a truck to the store, and there had to be a manager of that store so that we could actually purchase the cereal, and that we could have milk, and that you could experience God's goodness to you, which is your daily breakfast. And that's, I mean, that sounds trivial, that sounds small, but this is the way that God, for example, in Psalm 104, cares for every living thing. So all work is God's work. Whether you're in sales, whether you're a teacher, who's highly involved in the formation of a child or a college student or whatever that might be, whether you're a lawyer who's helping us to see that one day justice will surround us, whether you're a laborer who is lifting a heavy burden for the weak, whether you're in sales, whether you're in business, this is God's work and it is his gift to humanity. So we are participants with God himself, and the cultural mandate is a glorious calling both to do good and, this is verses 12 through 13 in Ecclesiastes 3, to take pleasure in our work. But how can we do that? Like, how can we do that? Because I know, I know the reality of some of us in this room, because we're all human beings living, as Steinbeck put it, east of Eden, that there is, yes, an acknowledgement that there is a good design for work, but there's also a deep frustration with it. Am I right? This is the second point. Let's consider this together. Because this is actually what Solomon, the writer of Ecclesiastes, wants us to do. Solomon the wise, as he's coming to the end of his life, he's calling us to acknowledge that tension. You might call it a paradox, not a contradiction. It's a paradox. It means two things that are seemingly opposed to one another, but you actually hold them in tension, and you have the complexity and the richness of what is taking place. It's got good design and our deep frustration. Look at Ecclesiastes 3. Go back to that text, verse 10. Solomon says, I have seen the business, the work that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. And he has made everything beautiful in its time. But also he has put eternity into the hearts of men and women, yet so that they cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. It's a really mysterious phrase, but... In this sort of poetic license, what Solomon is saying is that men and women, those who are image bearers of God himself, you have this longing for something that is eternal. He's placed eternity upon our hearts. And here's how I think it plays out within work, because I see it take place often, often like this. So I, I ran into um, this is a good friend who's... Um, he actually grew up in Highland Park in, in Dallas. Um, he was from a real prominent family there, grew up in the church. And he went off and um, got a great degree, uh, went to the University of Georgia, which I told him this is a lesser bulldog that we're working with here. Um, and uh, he came back and he, he got a job in risk management. And um, he came, I, I just kind of, we crossed paths and we were planning to get together, but I just said, hey, how, like, how are you doing? And he said, I'm doing okay. He said, I'm actually about to celebrate my 30th birthday. And I was like, oh, well, like you just, it's all over, man. And um, he kind of laughed and, and I said, no, I said, how are you feeling? And he said, actually, he goes, I don't, I don't know. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, he was like, things are going really well. And again, he went to a great school. He has a great family that's there. He said, I've built up my client base. Everything seems to be going well, but, and he kind of looked around a little bit like this. I, it, this is what he said. And he said, I just, like, I'm about to be 30, and is this it? Like, is this it? Meaning, is, is this all there is? Because I thought that there was something, like, I thought there was something beyond it. I thought, maybe I thought I'd be happier. Or maybe I thought I'd be more satisfied. Or maybe I thought that there would be just, like, another level that I could get to. 
Is this it? You ever had that question? And not just as you're turning into 30. You come to your 70s, your 80s. Is this it? And the gift that you have in Scripture is Solomon, who has seen it all, done it all, run it all in ways that are way more successful than you and I could ever dream of. And he's saying, this isn't it. There's something beyond it. There's something beyond it. And that deep frustration, that deep sense of dissatisfaction that a lot of us feel with work or our lives in this world or the projects that just don't get done or the sleepless nights or the teams that just drive us crazy like all get out, but we can't show them that that's the case. Scripture is calling us to acknowledge that, to see that for what it is. And here's the thing. I think that we can go often, a lot of us, in two directions with this, with that deep discontentment, that deep frustration. And I see this play out a lot. And I know, I mean, it's just a human dilemma. Again, this isn't a 20 and 30 year old thing in Dallas, Texas. We can go farther into it. We'll go, you know what? I'll just beat it. I'll just like, I'll just build up my client base or I'll just change jobs. And I'm not saying you're not called to change jobs from time to time or, or God can call you or lead you in different directions. But often it's a strategy to get away from discontent. So I'll just go farther in. I'll just be more successful. I'll just have more clients. I'll try to make more of a name for myself. I'll win more awards. I'll be seen as a good person. I'll just try to make, in the words of J.D. Rockefeller, a little more money. Because how much money is enough? Just a little bit more. All right? Just a little bit more. So you go farther in. Or you go, this is another strategy. You go farther out. You just try to get away from it. And you live in a culture and I live in a culture that is so eager to get you out of your current discontentment. It's everything from that terry cloth bathrobe, that's $69.95, to just every little series here and there on Netflix. I mean, every, anything that we can imagine. It's just a little hit. It's like a little dose to get us away from it all. And so we're, we overeat and we overdrink and we fantasize and we have all of these things as a way to try to get away from it. I think about this as a little bit more of comic relief. Um, Seinfeld, which is a show in the 90s, children, yeah, better than friends. Um, it's a hot debate. I don't know if you know that right now. But um, Seinfeld, there's a series where Jerry Seinfeld very famously sits in the 90s and he sits with his friend George Costanza at this diner and this whole one episode, George Costanza is sitting there. He's wearing sweatpants. He's just wearing sweatpants all the time. Some of you are laughing because I know you've seen this. And Jerry says, again with the sweatpants? Sorry, I don't have a good impression. I know some have a good Seinfeld impression. But George says, what? I'm comfortable. And Jerry says, do you know what message you're sending to the world? I give up. I can't compete in normal society. I'm miserable so I might as well be comfortable. I'm miserable, so I might as well be comfortable. That's kind of funny, but it's really true. There's a lot of us, myself included, who look to the comforts of this world because of the misery that we have faced in this world. And if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, this is where Christianity is, can become the smelling salts for those who have maybe given up on it. Is that it's not just Pollyanna and get over that or like tuck it away and put on a happy like face. It's this world is dark and you know it and I know it. It's really hard. But you know what Solomon says? God is good. So go deeper, like take it a level deeper. Ecclesiastes speaks on the whole, the whole of the book, to our deep frustrations. Just to give you a few other examples that kind of bookend this particular chapter, and Solomon speaks a lot to a variety of things, both here in Ecclesiastes and certainly within Proverbs. But he speaks to, to work and our vocation and industry within this world. And he says this, Ecclesiastes 2, verse 20 through 23. Again, this is the realism, the reality, the honesty he says, so I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Remember, this is King Solomon, the golden era, the king 
in Israel who led them to the top, as it were. One of the wealthiest, like a net worth that would just be mind-boggling in the ancient world. Did it all with great wisdom. And he said, I gave my heart up to despair when I look back on all of this, over the toil of my labors. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill, which is what Solomon did, must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. Solomon says, you can amass a lot. You can build a name for yourself and a reputation. And you know what? A lot of times you're going to leave it and it's going to be gone in a generation. Because either they'll, they won't appreciate it or they'll just forget who you are entirely. What has man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. Have you ever had a sleepless night because of coworkers or because of projects or whatever it is and you just, you find no rest? Or maybe you are sleeping, but there's, there's genuinely no soul rest, like the deep rest that we all long for, where we're working hard and we actually experience a little bit of satisfaction. We go to bed. And the big question is like, why is it like this? Like, why? Why is it like this? And notice here the author's use of toil. It's strenuous, it's anxiousness, it's burning, like it's burning the candle at both ends. It's working to the point of exhaustion. And remember, this was not a part of the reality in the very beginning. But when sin entered into the world in Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 17, God tells Adam, he says, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, because the two of you have eaten of the tree of which I have commanded you, you shall not eat cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life, thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of dust you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you will return. Solomon's saying that if you want to begin to live into a renewed vision for work, you got to start to acknowledge and get acquainted with the dust, which is all of us in this room. Our smallness, our sin, our frailty. So the question is, it's long. So is there hope? Like, that's the big question, because this is heavy. Is there hope? You take this all the way to the end in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, beginning in verse 13. Solomon says this. He comes to the great end, and he says, The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of men and women. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Solomon says, oh, there will be a great day of judgment. And that's going to be good in the sense that we long for justice and for it to be done well and right so that God sees every little thing and he brings it into account. But the issue with that is that we know we're part of the problem. And what it means to be a Christian is to actually acknowledge that we are a part of the problem. That yes, we're victims within a broken world, but we are perpetrators, sinners that have contributed to the rebellion and the heartache and the curse. Again, it's both and. It's the paradox. Don't lose that tension. So while this may be the end of the matter in Ecclesiastes, here's one of the things that we do know. This is actually not the end of the story of redemption. Because one day what God is going to do is what he promised all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, is that he would send one, the seed of the woman, into the world to crush the head of the serpent. And in so doing, what he would do is he would redeem, he would buy back this world with all of its brokenness, with all of its sadness, with all of its heartache. He would buy it back into the service of God himself. It's what we call the kingdom of God. And when Jesus Christ came into this world, that's what he came to proclaim. That here was the one. I think about places like John chapter 5 where he goes to this man. He makes a beeline for the left out, for the broken. 
This man who had been, an, it says, an invalid, paralyzed, left out, hopeless, if you want to call it that way, for 30 plus years, who's laying by this pool trying anything and everything to be healed. And Jesus walks straight up to him one day on the Sabbath, and the religious leaders don't like that very much, but what Jesus says to this man is, he says, look at me, do you want to be healed? And the man's going off about why he has tried all that, and he can't do any of that, and this and that. And Jesus again looks straight at him and goes, that's not what I'm asking I'm asking, do you want to be healed? The man says, yes. And Jesus begins to bring him back to life. That's all Jesus is doing in the Gospels, is bringing people, places, and things back to life. And what he calls it in John chapter 5 is the work of his Father. It's the work of cultivation and participation in this work of great renewal and redemption that God is doing in and through Jesus Christ. So much so that he goes to the cross, and you know what he says on the cross? It is finished. You know who else said it is finished a long time before Jesus said this? God the Father. At creation, he sat down, and it was the satisfaction of something that was complete. You know, like when you sit down after working for, you know, a long time in your backyard, and it's finally at a point where you can just kind of enjoy it for like 30 seconds, you know? And you sit down, and you just enjoy it. You rest. So when Jesus said it is finished, what he accomplished was the great work that we needed of a new righteousness of a right standing before the Father so that you and I can experience the deep rest that goes underneath the work that we are doing. Like the longing to try to prove ourselves or to make a name for ourselves or to be seen like this in this person's eyes or to get access in front of this eyes. It's all longing to want to be right with the world and right with ourselves and ultimately right before God. And what Jesus says is I have come ultimately to give that to you. This is a gift that I'm extending to you. And on the cross, when he rose again, do you know what the resurrection was doing? It was telling you that God the Father was vindicating the words of God the Son, saying, listen to him, because in him I am well pleased. And if you are united to him by faith, which means you come to him in humility, acknowledging your dust, acknowledging your sin, putting your faith like your trust in him, you are in, you are part of this redemption plan, this program that he's bringing about. That he has achieved and accomplished. So here's what that means. Just a quick word of application, looking at the promise of redemption of work. You see, the cross and the resurrection, the finished work of redemption means not just a consolation for the life that you've lived here and now, but a resurrection of the life that you've always wanted. In other words, the life as it was meant to be. The true happily ever after. Maybe you call it that. Therefore, the gospel gives to us both the promise, redemption of work, and a new motivation for our work. See, one of the great challenges is that you, you put your hand to something, a project, and you work at it, and you work at it, and it just doesn't ever feel like it really amounts to anything, right? So maybe you just get frustrated or agitated and you just kind of go about your day or just try to get by and get on through. The promise of the resurrection is that your labor is actually not in vain. Great story, short story, J.R.R. Tolkien, um, who wrote The Lord of the Rings. You don't have to have watched like all three of those movies to get this, I promise. Um, but he wrote a little book. He was experiencing writer's block as an author. He wrote a little book called Leaf by Niggle, like a tree leaf. Niggle is a painter. He lives in an old um, English like countryside, and he's always getting disturbed by neighbors. Like he's having to do just little menial things. And one of the things that he figures out later on in life is that he's really passionate about painting, and in particular, painting. He likes leaves, and he has this grand vision of this tree that he wants to paint on this huge canvas and give as a gift to the town. And so he's doing these menial jobs, and he's getting sick in between, and he. He basically comes to the point where his time is up and death comes for him and it's kind of a metaphorical like train driver. And so Niggle's really upset because all he sketched out to this great tree is just one leaf. So he gets on the train and the sadness just overcomes him. But as he goes to the great country, one of the things that he sees in the horizon is the tree in all of its like glory, and all of its grandeur. This is what he says. 
Before him stood the tree, his tree finished, its leaves opening and its branches growing and bending in the wind that Niggle had so often felt or guessed and yet had so often failed to catch. He gazed at the tree and slowly lifted his arms and opened them wide. It is a gift. Because that's the thing about grace and the whole thing about Jesus Christ. It's a gift. So here's the thing. Are you a city planner? One day in the new heavens and the new earth, there's going to be a new Jerusalem. Are you working on like a garden project where you just kind of little by little take things to neighbors and just kind of give? feels like a little kind of effort, but you like it here. One day there's actually going to be a garden city. And those kind of efforts are going to be lifted up to high priority to bless and serve others. Are you a doctor? Like fitness instructor? One day we're going to have resurrected bodies. This is the great promise that the gospel holds out to and gives to us as a new motivation for work. Okay, so what does this mean? And again, just a brief word. It means this. According to Ecclesiastes and in the words of C.S. Lewis Paralandria, be comforted, small one, in your smallness. He lays no merit on you. Receive and be glad. Fear God. Keep his commandments. Acknowledge your limits. Like go to bed. Go do your work, eat your food, love your family, go to bed. Quit trying to actualize yourself via your work, meaning some grand version of you that's finally going to make it once you reach this. Be faithful in what God has given to you. Do good to others. If, again, if you're here and you're in elementary or you, like, you're sort of at the grind of 40 years old or you're retired, do, like, do good to others. It's going to last into eternity. What do you have both the ability and the affinity to do right now so that you might encourage and sustain? Is that mentoring younger men and women in some area of business? Is that caring for your neighbors by taking them a meal? Is it taking care of your grandchildren, which, by the way, is the work of preservation and cultivation? This is all honorable to God himself. Take a day off. Acknowledge the Sabbath. And in the words of Ecclesiastes, try to enjoy it, knowing that life is hard, but God is good. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.